Uh, sometimes you get lucky in this business with timing, and I think that right now, the last couple of days, really in weeks, has been uh, sort of fortuitous and sort of serendipitous timing for, uh, for our guest here and our discussion because God, God knows there's a, there's a ton going on with California, but, but uh, John, thank you very much for doing this. Sure, Brian. Before be we begin the sort of framework of just focusing on California as a fourth generation Californian, it'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the macro framework because oil is important to Chevron, which I believe you guys are the biggest private employer in the state of California or one of. We're certainly one of them. You're one of the top five. So there were a lot of jobs are at stake here. Uh, what the hell is going on with oil and gas? Well, I'm glad you think this is a lucky time to be in the oil business. This is actually... No, it's a lucky a, time to talk to you. <laughs> um, th this is a very challenging time in the business. And uh, the way I think of it is um, oil is a vital product in our economy, but the demand doesn't change very much year to year. And it costs a great deal of money to invest in oil capacity. But if we get that wrong relative to demand, and there's a little bit too much oil out there, prices will drop fast. And if you think about what happens when, when there's a sale on a product, if the price of shoes goes down 50%, you might buy two pairs. But when the price of oil goes down 50%, you don't go out and buy twice as much fuel. So it's not very, demand isn't very sensitive to it. And supply, once you've made the invest, investment, is not very sensitive. And so people just keep producing until the market comes back into balance. And what we're seeing is too much oil is on the market for reasons we can get to, and prices have dropped. We've seen excursions up to 145 dollars a barrel in the last 10 years. We've seen this excursion down. Uh, this is common in commodity business, common in our business. And uh, the forces this, are at work to address that, but right now it's tough. The steepness of this drop is not common. This is a 2008 type drop. Well, uh, I have been with the company 35 years, and in those 35 years, I've seen five drops of 50% or more. So commodity prices can drop rapidly, but Over this, a year? It, uh, 50% in a very short period of time, mostly within, mostly within less than a year. It can happen. This is a severe drop when you think about where it was 14 months ago. You know, in your, in your uh, analogy about the shoes, but here's, the, here's so <laughs> Geppetto, the shoemaker, right? <laughs> if, if he was producing twice as many shoes as he could sell, my guess is Geppetto would stop making shoes. Right. Your industry seems to want to make more shoes. <laughs> well, what happens is uh, much of the oil that's produced in the world is long cycle. So when you start investing, it may take five years or eight years to bring on a development in the Gulf of Mexico, for example. Well, if you've already spent 90% of the money, you finish that project. So there's momentum from projects that are being completed that's adding to supply. And we've also seen uh, fairly resilient and some low-cost oil that's being produced in the shales in the United States. We all, we all are familiar with the shale oil story. And so there has been what analysts will call momentum in the supply picture, not to mention what's happened with Saudi Arabia adding a million barrels a day and other changes that have taken place. So, a million barrels we know about. A million, a million we know about um, it, to, to supply. So there is an oversupply now. But what I remind people of is uh, in our business, there's this thing called the decline curve. So once you make an investment, oil fields begin to decline. The, the typical shale well, for example, the first year from the time you put that well on production, 12 months later, production is typically declining 70%. And so the market does correct 85% in the first two years. That's one of the characteristics of shale drilling. So as the rig supply drops and there's less drilling, markets will correct. Um, it'll just take, it just, the debate is about how long it's going to take. Listen, th this panel is about California. Yeah. And when you look at, okay, obviously, gasoline is very important to California. I've noticed a few cars in the 405 now and then. Yes. Um, do you think oil is important to the state of California? Well, oil, natural gas, nuclear, coal, renewables, all energy is important. In fact, if you think about energy, uh, it is the backbone of the economy. A lot of us take it for granted. I travel extensively around the world, and I can assure you in many countries, they don't take it for granted. We're blessed with natural resources in this state um, and in this country, and so we have some choices in what we produce. But it is vital to our economy. 80% uh, of the world's energy comes from uh, oil, gas, and coal. That was true 20 years ago. And even under the most aggressive environmental policies that you can conceive of, it's still going to be 75% 20 years from now. So yes, oil, gas, uh, oil and gas are vital. 60% of our electricity in California comes from natural gas. So uh, hydrocarbons are vital to the economy in this state. So we're not all going to be driving around in solar-powered go-karts anytime soon. 
Well, technology continues to advance. Vehicle technology continues to advance. The internal combustion engine is getting more efficient. And uh, certainly electric vehicles have gotten a, a great deal of uh, notoriety. I think what we have to be careful of, particularly with technology forcing strategies, is just how much money do you want to put into forcing technology? I mean, last year, as an example, manufacturers of conventional vehicles paid Tesla $20,000 a vehicle to produce their cars. And, and we paid, the taxpayers paid Tesla buyers, generally wealthy people, 10,000 to buy one. So if you want to subsidize $30,000 a vehicle, that's a pretty, pretty expensive way to abate carbon or uh, achieve your environmental policies. I've got nothing against electric cars, but I think we have to adjust and be clear about what price we're willing to pay for uh, advancing or forcing technology. You know, it's an interesting state because having grown up here also, um, you know, you, you walk the hills of L.A. and there's pump jacks, you know, out there. And there's, you, you take off from LAX and you go over the El Segundo refinery and, <laughs> and sometimes you can see things offshore, not many, but, but, it's, but it seems like an industry that the state doesn't want. Well, there are different views in the state, to be sure. Uh, I am a native of California, and I've, I've watched the environmental movement in this state, and there have been a lot of good things that have come from the environmental movement. I remember what the air looked like in Los Angeles or the Bay Area when I was a kid, and it wasn't pretty. And so we've taken the emissions out of gasoline, we've gotten more efficient, and I think a lot of that is good. I think when it comes to some of the more extreme positions that we have today, uh, we just have to understand what the price and what the cost of those policies uh, will be. Um, I mean, right now, California has passed a number of laws um, that are mandating more renewables in the power grid, uh, that are a, a cap and trade system that's been put in place, a low carbon fuel standard that's been put in place. And I can tell you what the impacts will be. In fact, the California Air Resources Board can tell you what the impacts will be. And it's unambiguous. You are going to see higher gasoline prices. You're, we already have high electricity prices. So you are raising the cost of energy deliberately in this state. And by significant amounts. And so if you think about what the impacts are from those policies, uh, we're heaping costs on the people that can least afford yeah. it, and business will leave. And uh, we already have, I mean, electricity costs are twice what they are in Texas in California right now. So these are choices that we have to make, and I, I, I just favor transparency around what the real costs are. Uh, of these policies. And, and that's the important thing. I mean, it, you know, everybody, we're in the Ritz, you know, Carlton here, Marina Del Rey. So th this is, th this is a, this is a well-off group of people. Mm -hmm. And so we can all talk about, well, we need this and we need that. When you go up, especially to where you guys are based, the Bay Area, if you're a teacher or, you know, a blue collar worker, you have to live 75 miles away from your, your home or from your workplace because you can't afford a house in San Jose because it's a one, one million for a teardown. But now you got to pay three and a half bucks in gas. They're going to keep adding that. We, we do tend to forget, I think, it's not really a question, John, more of a statement that we forget that we've got to make sure the policies correct. I and mean, tell me if I'm wrong. The policies have got to be situated for everybody, not just for people that have the financial ability to be green. Well, I being green right now largely is still the realm of the, the well off. Well, we just have to talk about the balance. What, what are we going to achieve by the green policy, if you want to call it that, and what's the cost going to be? And uh, the, these trade-offs, uh, we, we talk about the benefits, we don't often talk about the cost. The average Californian lives paycheck to paycheck. The average to, American does. The too. average American lives paycheck to paycheck. And so uh, certainly if electricity prices double or gasoline prices go up by a dollar a gallon, as CARB says they will, um, it, you know, electricity is going to go up 37% with the new standard that was put in place. Um, so those are fine, but for me, I'll just pay it. For many of you, you may just pay it. But for the average Californian, it's crowding out life. And I think that's the untold story here. And we just have to be sober about it and be sure that uh, we're not forcing in technology or forcing in requirements. I mean, right now, with the laws that we've passed, uh, the legislature has abdicated responsibility for energy. They've turned it over. To who? To the California Resources Board. And CARB has good people. Don't get me wrong, but laws have given them the discretion. Because we've passed aspirational laws around the low carbon fuel standard and others, that we don't know how to meet. We just pay fines in order to meet them, uh, and CARB will act with discretion. Well, business is forward looking. Business sees higher costs. Business sees this discretion where they don't know where the markets are going to go. 
and they do what the big tech companies have done up in the Bay Area. They move their data centers to North Carolina. You know, we moved our data center to San Antonio, right next to Microsoft. Uh, you know, so business makes rational choices. And I think manufacturing is at risk in this state if we continue to put in policies that raise energy. Do you feel like the legislature has punted a bit then? I mean, you've taken elected officials responsible to the people, and they've passed a huge responsibility onto unelected officials. Well, I, I, I think we just, th there has always been some aspiration in laws th that are passed. Uh, certainly, we've seen improvements uh, as a result of encouragement to adopt the latest technologies. My concern is when you pass aspirational laws, in other words, laws we, we don't know how to meet them, um, then, and then provide the discretion to a regulator to implement them as they see fit, you don't know what you're going to get. And as I say, there are dedicated individuals at the Resources Board, but they have an agenda. And, it, and I, I think the legislature would uh, do well to take care. Just recently, they did take some care uh, when there was a proposal to arbitrarily reduce uh, hydrocarbon consumption by 50% by 2030. And a lot of Democrats in the Central Valley, in the farming communities and elsewhere, pushed back on this because they, they didn't know how we're going to get there. And they, what's it going to cost to put diesel fuel in my harvester, uh, et cetera. So we just have to think these things through and not yeah. just see the green side we, of the we, we, we do. For, it's funny thing about California. And, you know, it's, again, I forget it even as a native Californian. Because I left along, my, my, my dad owned a gas, my grandfather and my father both owned gas stations. <laughs> and uh, my family, we lost everything, we had to move east. And if you look at, I did this on my show uh, last year, so I don't know if it's still true, but I thought it was interesting then. The cost of a U-Haul from California to Texas was three times more than Texas to California. Everybody's moving to Texas if they can. And I'm not advocating for Texas, but I wonder if you could start up Chevron today would it be in California? Well, we we started here 135 years ago, so That's we're a long time ago. So it is a long time ago. So uh, we we are a California company. We've got a big business here. I think many are familiar. We've got two refineries in the state, a big oil producing operation. Our headquarters are up in Northern California, and there are a lot of good things about about California. I haven't talked about the strengths of California, uh, but but there are many good things about this state. In fact, in fact, being located near the tech sector, up uh, near the Silicon Valley, has some positives has some positives to it. And some uh, negatives. But it's, it's, I, I am concerned about some of the, some of the directions of, of policies. There's some that are not specifically related to energy that I think the state has to take a hard look at. The governor's done a good job in trying to restrain spending, but we haven't really addressed some of the fundamental issues that the state, that the state has in terms of uh, costs and pensions uh, for, for public workers. Uh, we, we haven't fundamentally reformed the state, and we have very high marginal tax rates in the state. We're blessed with a tech sector. We're, best, we're blessed with an entertainment uh, sector that's very good. We're, we're blessed with many things, but it's very uneven right now. Uh, the Silicon Valley's doing well. Parts of LA are doing well. But if you go in the Central Valley and many of the rural counties, mm. it isn't doing very well at all. And we, we just have to remember that California is a big state, and we've got to be sure policies are going to work for everyone in the state, not and, just a few. And that's, that's the thing, again, you know, I, I don't believe that much of America knows they understand how big California is and that they've got the stars and they've got the Zuckerbergs. California is the biggest agricultural producer in the United States. California is the biggest manufacturer in the United States. Roughly one in eight Americans lives in California. Mm -hmm. And as I've argued, California, and Mike Milken will appreciate this, California, L.A. and Orange County is actually now the bond capital of the United States. It's not New York anymore. Because you've got all these firms now, Guggenheim and TCW and MetWest and Jeff Gunlock's Double Line and PIMCO down in Newport Beach. Congratulations, Marina Del Rey. You are now the bond capital of the United States. So, so this is an incredibly important state for the country outside of Brad Pitt and liking something. Right? So, so, so how, how, do we, how do we expand our policies to make sure that the people in El Centro or Lodi, that they're going to prosper? Well, uh, certainly... Uh, a lot of them might work for Chevron. Well, there are a long list of things that I think many have talked about that the state can work on. One is being sure it's got a sustainable fiscal uh, system in place. We've benefited from a strong stock market, the IPO, Facebook IPO, and all those things. That's great. It adds to the tax revenue, right? And, it's and, fantastic. And, and, and that's wonderful. But I think we have to be sure that we have a tax, a, a tax system that will work over time. You know, I, I've just uh, spent a few minutes talking about energy policy. And if we want manufacturing jobs, in this state, in other words, jobs besides just the information uh, jobs that are being produced in the Silicon Valley. If we want to build things here, we have to be sure that our energy costs are competitive. 
relative to other options. So we need to take a hard look at some of the policies we put in place, and I would advocate reform uh, of, of those policies. And then, we, uh, and then one area that we haven't touched on uh, are schools. And I was raised in the public schools in California. Me too. Uh, up, up through the University of California at, at Davis. Uh, my wife was a teacher, my mother was a teacher. I got teachers throughout my family. And uh, it's been really sad to watch the decay of the education system in California. And Chevron does what it, what it can. Uh, even today, my wife uh, volunteers in, in a high school uh, teaching science. And we contribute to programs like Project Lead the Way and, and others that are curriculum-based uh, programs that help help teachers uh, with, build the right kind of skills in our students. But uh, there's no getting away from the fact that the numbers say that our education system is not competitive, that we are, we, we, we rank near the bottom. We're sort of mid-pack in terms of. What do we, so how do we fix it? Well. <laughs> Let's find solutions. Yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot of things. I, I, I would uh, certainly, it, it's hard to say that with the money we put in, uh, and teacher salaries aren't bad in this state, um, there's something about the accountability and management system that we have over our education today that's not getting the results. And it, it's, uh, it's probably worth getting a lot of people that d do that for a living, but it's very clear when the policies that we followed for the last 20, 30 years uh, haven't made progress. So when you're perpetuating what you're already doing and always just asking for more money, there may be other things structurally that need to be done to improve our education system. We try to be a positive force, but there's, there, there's nothing that one company uh, can do to, to address this. But we see, we see the results. We've got some fine public schools, certainly at the university level, and even at lower levels, we've got some fine public schools. But on average, particularly in places like the inner city of Los Angeles, um, it's not working. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not working. It's a difficult situation, but there's also these financial constraints too. And, you know, what, Prop 13, or I think it was, I mean, we, my family left a long time ago, but um, California is this sort of unusual place. It's, I think, I love this state. It's still my home a long time ago. I think it does trade a little bit on the weather. You know, you know what I mean? Uh, it's a place people want to live. I mean, you just walk 10 feet outside and boats and it's 70 degrees and it's spectacular and it's wonderful. Uh, but it's kind of also a quirky state in a sense that there's a lot more direct sort of voting and on these propositions and things. We don't have that in, in, in New Jersey for the most part and other places uh, around the country. How would you change the way California is governed? Well, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's a Republican or a Democrat. Oh, forget. Issue, let's not get into political issue, parties. Issue, like, what would you do to change, to make it smarter to get things done? Well, certainly we need uh, a better and more open discussion uh, about our priorities. In, in California, uh, there seems to be this um, sort of one, one train of thought that it's the tech sector and the information sector that is what drives it. And people don't realize that the San Joaquin Valley, we generate a lot of jobs. I mean, Milken did a study a few years ago that said that Chevron was directly and indirectly responsible for one out of every 220 jobs in the state. So there's, there's a backbone to the economy and manufacturing. You have to think about, are the policies you're putting in place going to generate jobs for, for the middle class? There's a hollowing out that appears to be taking place in California. And you have to address that directly. And you have to address the incentives associated with that. I've talked about tax policy, and I've talked about energy policy. That would be a good place to start. Um, you know, I mean, the governor was in, is in Paris this week. And you know, I read an article this morning, and there were, a, I mean, here's an example of a quote I heard. Never underestimate the coercive power of government. Keep, we're going to keep regulating and keep taxing. That's a quote from the governor yesterday. Now, the governor has been supportive of the oil and gas business in the, in the San Joaquin Valley. But, and on his own ranch. Well, um, well look, look, the governor's done some good, good things with the state. I, I would just say that, that we, we need to work on the regulatory environment. CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act in this state, needs to be reformed. It's not just stopping private developments. A third of the things that CEQA is stopping are public projects, like bridges, highways, roads, things yeah. of that sort. So there's reform of regulation, there's education, there's tax policy, there's energy policy. There, there, there's fertile ground in all of these areas, and it's, and it's going to take some leadership. And uh, it's, it's going to take more than just the governor. It's going to take both parties working together. I think the media can play a positive role by highlighting some of the inconsistencies that are taking place uh, so that we can uh, really get California onto a better footing going forward. Now, let me be clear. It's California, it's not as though California is doing a lot worse than other states up to now. Because California has many strengths. 
The question is, where is it, where is it going to be going forward, given some of the things that are, put, that are in place today and planned for the future? One thing I will say about California, every time you think it's doomed, it comes back. Like, you know, I think over the, you know, the his, at least my own personal history, looking back in cycles, because it is a nice place to live. And I think people want to live here. It is. Uh, and so humans have a great capacity to overcome obstacles and make things work. The problem for, like, the oil and gas industry is that whenever you talk about anything, of course, it becomes this sort of environmental hotbed, right? And everybody just wants to politicize it in terms of, you know, well, you're this or you're that or whatever. So let's forget about that. Let's take another example. This is the drought, okay? And I've mm -hmm. done my show from Reservoir here where it's, uh, my God, I mean, the levels are terrifying. I mean, you know, we farmers can't get water. And so let's talk about actual stuff you need for life, <laughs> right? Water. You need that to exist as a human being. And you look at the state, and you look at what's happening, and many people I, that are not political will say, well, we don't have water in part because of decisions that were made 20 and 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're sitting on, what, 100 quadrillion gallons of water right there. Mm -hmm. And they finally got a desal plant open in Carlsbad, but the effort it took to get that, some people say, is harder than opening up a nuclear reactor. That's the kind of example of California. Like, how do we make sure that we can meet the environmental goals that we want, but also make sure that we have the things we need Desalinization plants and water should not be a political issue. Uh, we uh, this this should not be political. The first thing on our hierarchy of needs is water. Uh, we we do need water, and uh, you know, as I say, I grew up in the state. In fact, my family we were, as my grandfather used to say, almond ranchers um, up in uh, Northern California. You're what? Almond, not almonds. He calls them almonds. Um, oh, <laughs> that, that, that's what farmers call them. And uh, but but since that time, when I was when I was in school. Um, the population of the state has doubled, and we really haven't built any, any more water infrastructure. And so, uh, to me, there are, there are market-based solutions. We have historical water rights. We have impediments to movement of water. Uh, there's actually a fair amount of water in the state, notwithstanding uh, the drought, which is... Uh, which, it's just not in the right di place. Difficult. Well, but it, it will take some water infrastructure and, I think, water marketing uh, concepts that can work. I mean, let's be, let's be clear. We live in a, an area that's prone to drought, and that is desert. Um, in many parts, and the population can in, continues to grow. So you're going to need to bring water in and utilize water well. Uh, to me, it would, it would be uh, desirable to have uh, e easier mechanisms, and it'll, it may take some infrastructure uh, to move water so that those that have the rights can, can get it to, to, the, to the city. You think we could get that need. infrastructure built to do that? Well, well, I don't know. We, we have built water infrastructure in the past uh, to, to, to move water. Um, up in Northern California, there's a fair degree of ability to move water. As you get lower in the state, it's, it's harder. And there have been a variety of different proposals of how to do that. Uh, I, I do believe in the power of, of, of markets, and those that have water rights uh, can, can move it. I mean, we, we spend as much uh, growing alfalfa for feed, as much water on growing alfalfa for feed as humans consume. Uh, d directly, and so there is water in the state. Uh, but if humans we, consume alfalfa only in California. Humans consume, human consumes As water. As they eat it with their chopsticks and their Prius. Humans consume water equivalent to the water we use to grow the alfalfa in the state. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, uh, agriculture needs needs to get its uh, needs needs to get its share. But there, there's there's enough water for people in the state. I think if we uh, if, if we allow it to to move and uh, to migrate to where it's needed. I can honestly say I've never had a conversation where alfalfa came up, except for if my hair was sticking up well, in the back. I, I, actually, I pay a lot of attention to water. In the San Joaquin Valley, we're a net contributor of water. One of the things that people don't realize about my business is when we produce oil out of the ground, water comes up. In fact, more water than oil. And so we separate that, that water, we, we treat it, and it goes to the water district um, uh, there. In so fact, it's good water. Yeah, yeah, it's it's water that gets tested and meet, meets all the meets all the standards, and we've been doing that for years. Did you see videos of people turning on their thing and like fire comes out? Oh, well, <laughs> oh, you're talking about that? Uh, yeah, well, that's that that actually wasn't even an oil well. Uh, it wasn't even a gas well. That was a homeowner drilling a water well that hit biogenic gas, um, but it made it into videos, and so that's that's what happens. But uh, look, powerful video when you turn on a faucet to brush your teeth and flame comes out. Um, well, that. Th that one was that one that'll was, get them clean. Well, that one was that one. As I say, that one was later shown to be uh, actually a homeowner drilling a water well, having nothing to do with my industry. You know, it's it's uh, it's a great state. It's it's got all these quirks as we've talked about. And and um, how about infrastructure? Okay, that's kind mm -hmm. of a pet pet project of mine. Also, if you if you've ever been to New anybody here from New Jersey? Okay, yeah, I, yeah. I'm sorry too. That's I'm in the same boat. I go through about eight tires a year because of potholes and. 
Um, you talked about the need for more schools. Right now, so much of this stuff is built solely with government funds. Are you in favor of private money in the infrastructure marketplace? Well, I think we've, I think we've had that. I think there are, we, we've seen toll roads. There are, there are toll roads in the state. I think we're going to have to look for innovative solutions. If taxpayers aren't willing to fund infrastructure, um, I mean, it's, we've, we've had tolls on bridges for a long time. There are tolls on roads. I think we're going to have to look for creative solutions uh, to enable that, the infrastructure to be built. I mean, we do pay gasoline taxes in, in this state. There are other sources of funding. We have to be sure those funds are directed to the priority. Sometimes these funds go elsewhere, but make sure the funds are directed properly to the infrastructure projects that we need. And then beyond that, um, we are going to need to look for, for solutions. But I've been on a few toll roads uh, in the state, and I think you'll see more of that. What about buildings, things that we need? <laughs> Schools, hospitals? Oh, well... Well, um, I talked about CEQA and, Airports, and, and how it's being Maybe train just, stations. I'm not sure I have all the answers to all the building needs. I will say the permitting process in California is difficult. It costs four times as much to permit a gas station here as it does in Texas, for example, for us. Um, and I think that's common everywhere. It takes longer and costs more to build anything in the state. And a lot of it is the, regula the regulatory and permitting environment that we fostered in the state. Uh, the biggest example I've used is CEQA, which from an, on an, from an industrial point of view inhibits uh, many developments. And it's not as though we shouldn't have a, a, a permitting process, but we need to think about how to enable things to be built, enable things to be done, instead of how can anybody stop anything at any time. And I'm sure you get this, John, because listen, you're a successful guy, you run a big corporation. I think the theme that you see in the criticism is you're making, because you're making good points to rational people, but you also, people will say, well, Here's a CEO of a public company complaining or whining about the state's inaction. And that's sort of the, the default criticism, at least from the media side, that, that we hear is that CEOs, oh, they're always moaning and groaning about something. You know, how do you get over that criticism? So to use your word from earlier, we can have a sober discussion about real problems and try to take some of the hyperbole and the finger pointing and the name calling out of it. Sure. Well, I, I talked about some of the things that California is doing on, on, on a policy measure. L let me give you an alternative to what we're doing, because AB 32, the low carbon fuel standard, cap and trade, the renewal portfolio standard, unambiguously will raise costs, and they'll do nothing for greenhouse gas emissions. And so you say, well, what should you do? If those policies aren't right, what should you do? And the first thing uh, Americans need to do and Californians need to do is to understand that the concerns about greenhouse gas emissions are a global issue. California is less than 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. is less than 15% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And we've reduced our greenhouse gas emissions for two reasons and two reasons only over the last few years. The miracle of hydraulic fracturing, which has allowed natural gas to displace coal, one. And number two, uh, the advancements of the internal combustion engine, which have allowed vehicle efficiency to improve. The rest of it is noise. And a lot of it, it will be impediments to industrial development. Beyond that, around the world, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. The low-hanging fruit on CO2 emissions are around the world. I mean, just as an example, the United States has an economy twice the size of China, but their greenhouse gas emissions are twice the size of the U.S. So the work needs to be done around the world. And there are three or four quick things that I'll mention that we can do. One, if you're not embracing nuclear energy, then you're not interested in a solution because there's no, there's no forecast I have seen at a global level of reducing greenhouse gas emissions meaning, meaningfully that doesn't include nuclear power, and I'm not in that business. Two, we have to enable natural gas because it is the fuel we have today. We're burning fuel oil in the Northeast still. We need to permit pipelines so that we can, uh, so that we can get natural gas to the customers that we need. By the way, there's an economic advantage to doing it as well. That's two. Number three, and this is something Bill Gates has said and that I've been saying for five years, the, the research, government has scarce resources. Instead of channeling money into subsidies for preferred industries, and creating crony capitalists, we should be doing early stage research. Bill Gates said this recently. He said it's going to take an energy miracle to abate carbon in a serious way. That energy miracle is going to come from research, not from the existing technology. It's going to come from something new. So that we, sh we should be channeling our sca scarce money into early stage research. Those are three things that we can do. Energy efficiency. A lot of the infrastructure and new consumption of of hydrocarbons around the world are going to take place in the developing world. We should enable American companies to be competitive around the world, make sure our tax structure and otherwise so that the best technology, the most energy efficient technology is implemented around the world. All of these don't sound very glamorous, 
But when you add them up, they will do far more than trying to price people out of hydrocarbons and then hoping something comes up to replace them. You know what? It, you know what is glamorous? Glamorous is turning on the flipping the switch and have the lights come on and turning on your faucet and have water come out. And there's a lot of places in the world that I've been to that I'm sure you've been to that don't have that. Well, that don't have that luxury. And, but you have to admit that California is a far better place now in, in in many ways environmentally than it was. I remember my 13th birthday. I went to a place called Raging Waters in San Dimas, California, most known for Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And I remember about halfway through the day, we had to sit down because our chest hurt. You ever remember that? Anybody here remember? Because you're breathing in smog and you, it would hurt. It would burn, actually. When you, and then you sort of take a rest and then you'd go back out and play. It, it's a better place than it was. Like, you admit the environmental push has been good in many ways. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've, I've... The air was I've, gross I've, 30 years ago. We have made progress, but... Other countries are going down that pathway. China has, should, China has that same priority today. Their, their first priority is to get energy to their people. Their second priority is to clean up their cities. They're where we were, actually worse, than where we were 40 years ago. So of course there are environmental actions that are needed. We just have to be sure we're doing the right sort of analysis around which policies are really going to make a difference for the problems we're trying to the address. The average income in China is 4,000 US dollars a year. They're 125th in per capita GNP. The overall economy is big, but they've got a long way to go. But that's a separate panel at a different Milken conference. That's a different conference. Uh, that'll be the state of, of China, not the state of California summit. Um, now's the point where we're gonna, we are going to take some questions. I think you saw the email. There it is. Guys, how come we don't have, like, WhatsApp and Snapchat? Snapchat's based right here. We should at least have, like, a way to snap in a, in a question. All right, so we've got a few questions coming in, which I'll read, and, and uh, John, you can answer. Uh, would you support raising a gas tax to fund highway improvements? Well, the first thing we have to do is make sure that the gas taxes and other taxes that are going to, to highways and roads are, are going to the right location. Now, remember, those that are advocating more electric vehicles, they don't pay that tax. So you're going to have to, with the policies we're putting in place, we're going to have to find uh, new sources of revenue beyond the gasoline tax. Uh, but, uh, I mean, ca California's gasoline taxes are among the highest are already among the highest in the country. So, so the question is, what are we doing with the taxes that we have today? But once we understand that, we can take a look at those taxes. Is that a yes? No? Well, I, I don't, I, it's, it's, not, it's not clear to me that we're, that we're undertaxed in this state. That, that's a, people are always looking to raise taxes. But, but taxes are, are already among the highest in, in the country here. Well, the only thing t New Jersey can say, John, is that we've got the cheapest of is gas. I paid a buck seventy-two the other day. Why is gas so expensive in California? I'm just personally curious. Well, the cost of do doing business are, are higher here from the land you buy all up to and including the permitting fees I talked about. So one, costs are higher. Two, we have policies. Uh, you know, the, the, the fuel's under the cap. Your, your tailpipe emissions are now under the cap and trade scheme. And so that has raised costs yeah. uh, in, in the state. And so there are a number of very specific policies that have been put in place in California that are, ra that are raising the price of gasoline. The, the low carbon fuel standard is in place here. And by the way, these things are just beginning. They're going to get worse. CARB says gasoline prices are going to go up a dollar a gallon relative to the rest, uh, rest of the country. So there's more of this coming. And it's, in, it, it's already in, um, in the works. And it's just a question of how severe it will get. That was a personal question, because like I said, we lost our gas station in 1981 during the gas crunch. My dad had a mobile, <laughs> mobile station, sorry, on the corner of Whittier and I think Beach. Boulevard in La Habra, California. We ended up losing that in 81, so I get a little, I get a little ticked off about that. I'm issue. sure it was a nice full-serve station. Yeah, and he worked me when I was 10 years old at it, too, and didn't pay me. <laughs> I have to go back and get some income from my father back in the day. Will you discuss Tom Steyer and his public policy prescriptions going forward in the California economy? Obviously, Tom is a very well-known, um, you know, investment manager, fund man hedge fund manager, wealthy guy. Well, look, a lot of big I, ideas. I think there are a lot of activists that are very willing to impose costs on the people of California because they're not concerned about paying their electricity bill, paying their gasoline bill. But I've already made a number of comments about how ineffective I think some of the policies are. And so I think what, what activists, um, uh, particularly billionaire activists, uh, need to understand is that average Californians need affordable energy. And the policies that we're putting in place to raise energy costs aren't going to be effective with them. And creating, creating a new class of crony capitalists who are dependent upon uh, regulatory decisions made by unelected bureaucrats is not a very good policy. 
it said eight. We had eight questions, but the, 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 it's, the screen is now blank, so I'm going to just ask my own questions. That's it? But Two? Until, yeah, no, I'm sure that, here we go. Uh, our, oh, this is a good one. We, how many, we have any Tesla owners in the audience? We got a couple of them here. I, I'm thinking about getting one. Are you planning on introducing electric charging capabilities in your retail gasoline stations? Um, we haven't. We do have some dealers that own stations that may choose to do that. We would that be an independent we, dealer decision? Yeah, in many cases it would be, but as a policy, Chevron hasn't made that decision, no. How many but, stations do you own of your stations, by the way? Oh, actually, we own about 500, mo of, and, and we own tens of thousands around, around the but world. But most so are owned by independent guys like my dad did. Most, most are owned by independent. So I guess they're talking about corporate-owned stations. No plans to do that yet. Uh, uh, no, and uh, for all I know, there may be a, a few stations, but it's not something uh, that we have contemplated um, as a policy. Okay. By the way, I got nothing against Tesla. I, I mean, I saw a few Tesla owners. It's a nice car. I just don't think I should pay you $10,000 to, to drive one. The average income level the person that buys them is pretty high. Well, I, I, I said that. I took some heat. I said that on my show about a year ago. I said, right now, electric cars primarily are third cars for wealthy people. You know, if, if you got a range, not the Tesla, but the other cars of 80 miles, I'm a car guy, you got a range of 80, 85 miles, that's not going to be your primary vehicle. So, you know, we will get there. We'll get there. I mean, yeah. electric, by the way, electric cars are fun to drive. Yeah. There's no torque, there's no combustion lag. Uh, it, okay, this is interesting. Uh, this, this goes to our TV interview afterwards, I suspect. It looks like OPEC is dead as a cartel. Is that right? Would you agree with that? And how might that impact Chevron and the global economy? Well, OPEC hasn't acted like a cartel for really for 30 or 40 years. And in fact, it's largely a social organization today, is, is the way I, I, I describe it. They should get together with FIFA. A and <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I didn't mean that kind of social organization. No, I did. Organization. It's OK. Uh, um, and and, and what, I, what I really mean by that is uh, OPEC has changed a lot. When you, when you think of the days going back 40 years ago where they constrained supply and prices tripled or quadrupled, um, you know, that, that worked for a short period of time. And then what they saw is demand was impacted and it induced other forms of supply. And so OPEC is producing about what it was 30 or 40 years ago. And their market share has gone from 50% down to about a third. And the only one with spare capacity now is Saudi Arabia. And if you look at the pressures in all these countries, uh, the, the, the domestic spending pressures that they have, most of them are not willing to cut production. And there have been some humorous anecdotes that uh, Minister Naimi from Saudi Arabia has said. But, but basically, everyone wants Saudi Arabia to cut. Most of the other members of OPEC don't want to cut. And by the way, the two biggest producers besides uh, Saudi Arabia today are Russia and the United States, who are not OPEC members. And so they're seeing that there are many sources of supply. And the view is if we cut production, it'll just get backfilled by th those other sources. And Russia, and I'm just going to follow up on that. I'm sorry, before we get to the next question. Russia has to keep pumping, don't they? Venezuela has to keep pumping. They are in a really difficult economic situation. So we can't expect them to cut production, can we? They need the cash. Oh, uh, in fact, one of the things that's happened to Russia that's kept more supply than we might have expected a year ago is with the collapse of their currency because of sanctions, uh, the cost of doing business in Russia in dollar terms have gone down. And so they're actually producing more than they needed, than, than they could before. But most OPEC countries are really struggling right now because they've got this choice between, with their revenue going down, they've got big social spending commitments. And so they've got choice between reinvesting in the business and, and feeding their people. And so there are real choices, uh, real painful choices. And we're seeing that play out in places like Venezuela and Nigeria and elsewhere. We're stuck on the, can we get to the next question? We're stuck on the, uh, is that, oh, is that, that's, oh, there we go, that's a new one. Oh, that, that is a new one, okay. So, oh, and this is, okay, this is, tends to be the, the criticism yeah. when we go after, good, you know, talking about electric cars. This is, this is the number one thing. They say, well, oil and gas company, and the, the question is, how much would you estimate the total number of subsidies and tax breaks for oil and gas versus electric vehicles and factor it in environmental and health risks? That's the number one criticism. Yeah, well, hey, oil and gas, don't complain because you've got plenty of breaks also. Yeah, well, it's been an incredibly profound, uh, profound and false narrative on this subject because we have leader, political leaders who keep repeating it and then the press keeps repeating it. And what I do with my typical interviews, I say, well, can you name the subsidies that the oil industry receives? And they say things like, well, the manufacturer's credit, except that we're discriminated against in the manufacturer's credit. We actually, they actually call, de call, call deducting an expense a subsidy. Intangible, we actually get to deduct some, a cost we incur. And so there's this whole uh, LIFO inventory accounting is a subsidy according to the federal government. 
Well, but anyone can use LIFO inventory accounting for the accountants in the room. So it's, it's, a, it's a deceptive and false narrative um, on, on that subject. Even if you count those things, renewables get per unit of energy 200 times what we get, even if you count those things as subsidies. So what I invite people to do when they hear about the subsidies is dig into it. Ask people questions because it's been it's been a, a frankly a, a false narrative on that. Subject. And I believe it's a, and I, I don't want to be exactly I don't want to go make exact numbers, but a couple years ago I know the Exxon is the or was the single biggest taxpayer in the United States for many years. If it not still is, I don't know. I, I don't know what they pay. All I know is our effective tax rate has been about forty percent the last few years. Now th this year we're not making much money, and so taxes paid are going down. But the good thing for consumers is you're benefiting from lower prices, except in California. Uh, prices are lower, but just not they're as low, not five, but not, not as low as elsewhere. <laughs> Come to New Jersey, everybody. It's we're just giving away gasoline, and it's all full serve, by the way, in New Jersey. I don't know a lot of people know that. There's no self serve. It's illegal. It's illegal. Them in Oregon. I can't stand it. I like to pump my own gas, running so much. But anyway, what are the three best things that could happen for Chevron in the next three years? Um, well, we have we have a lot of things that, that I would call self help things that we need to work on. Uh, we have a number of, number of projects under construction, including two big LNG projects in Australia. We need to finish those projects. And Are you? Are you going to finish them? We're going to finish them. One's going to start up in the first quarter. The one, another one's going to start up the end of next year. And so we need to we need to finish the projects that are under construction. We need to keep getting our costs down, and we need to get our, our situation more balanced. We have a strong balance sheet. We're, we can weather this storm. But we've got to get our costs and spending in line with the revenue that's coming in. And Chevron, Chevron can do that. Um, it's going to be a challenge for the industry. Uh, you notice I didn't say the best thing would be higher oil prices. I, you know, we're a price taker. Uh, prices, uh, we, we take what the market gives us. We've got to get our costs in line uh, consistent with whatever uh, the market gives us or doesn't give us. Yeah, we're going to go up north here. What is the future of the development of the Canadian oil sands? Well, oil sands are a huge, a huge resource uh, for, for the world, and I expect that they'll continue to be developed. Um, low prices uh, make it difficult. In fact, if you think about different classes of assets that can be developed, um, some oil sands can be developed at, at say, 50, 50 to $60, but some cannot. So I think this will, be a more, this will be a challenging time for oil sands development. But it's a huge resource base, and I think, I think the resource will be developed in due course. If we have another one, there we go. This will be the last question, too, by the way. So you described the tough business climate here and mentioned that Chevron has moved its data center to Texas. Would your company consider pulling its headquarters out? You know, that, that's really not, not our intent. I, I, I love California. It, it's my home. It's been this company's home. We have a big business in this state. And I think, ultimately, people know they, they, they need our products and they want uh, good quality companies to provide the products to them and they want the jobs and other things that we do in the community and elsewhere in the state so that's you know that that's uh, picking up our marbles and leaving isn't something that I'm planning to, to do but our investments are directed by the economic environment we see in the state and so as important uh, to where we're headquartered is how much more an investment will you put in the state if the environment isn't conducive to it. And I think that's really the opportunity for the state is to get the conditions right so that we can continue uh, to invest and deliver the products um, and do the things that we do that, that, that help California get better. So it's San Ramon for a while anyway. It's, uh, it's, it's San Ramon. You're not the Raiders. No. <laughs> well, be careful. They, they, they... Well, I know they're coming this way, it looks <laughs> yeah. like. Yeah, not that I have any inside information on that. Uh, let's give a big hand to John Watson of Chevron, please. Thank you. John, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.